Welcome to Will Radio, part one. Strategies for idiosyncratic and creative thinking, and quite possibly idiosyncratic and creative spelling in this document. Coming to you via audio, and also very high definition recording of Emacs text buffer. Maybe I'll record this in 8K ultra high definition. Today I want to talk about something very close to my heart, which is idiosyncratic and creative thinking and non-conventional thinking. That's really at the heart of what I'm interested in, my approach to research and exploring programming languages and everything else, and thinking in general. It's something I, I pay a lot of attention to, and I try to collect different approaches and strategies. So I would like to share at least some strategies that I've come across that I think are helpful, at least to myself. And, you know, you could ask, well, are you creative? Do you think idiosyncratically? Who are you to tell me these things? And my response to that is only as soon as you start thinking that way, you have left the realm of idiosyncratic and creative thinking. Okay, you're now entering a world of judgment and weighing things, which is a different realm. So I'm, I refuse to answer that question. All right. First strategy, identify the most promising or standard approaches to a problem and then do anything but that. So this is a story that I have from when I was studying algorithms. You know, I originally started out with a degree in education and special education. I was a special ed teacher for several years and I worked at a summer camp for kids and adults with disabilities and I became the camp director. I did all these things while I was interested in programming. And then at some point I went back to school and I started taking computing classes, computer science classes. And I was older than most of the students, I guess you would say I was a non-traditional student. I was very motivated because I was interested in programming. I really liked programming as a hobbyist. I'd been programming for a long time. And also because I wanted to make a career change, you know, I was super, super motivated to work hard. So, you know, I, I worked really hard. I had a lot of fun. I spent a lot of time learning algorithms and, you know, quickly it was pretty apparent to the instructor of that class that, you know, I was different uh, than the other students just in terms of the amount of time I was putting in. And, you know, I would always solve extra problems if there was a test where, you know, there we're preparing for the test and there are 10 problems to solve. I would solve 20 and that kind of thing. And an interesting thing happened. You know, I took, took an exam, the midterm exam, and I did much, much better than anyone else in the class. Uh, almost embarrassingly, you know, <laughs> better. Um, I was actually embarrassed I didn't tell anyone my score on the exam. Now, of course, you know, in hindsight, it's like, yeah, you got 19-year-olds who are, you know, hanging out and partying and trying to figure out what they really want to do. And then you've got this, this older, you know, uh, very experienced programmer, at least much more experienced programmer coming in, you know, really eager, wanting to make a career shift and also just in love with programming, you know, devoting huge amounts of time to studying. So, you know, well, the thing that happened is uh, exactly what you'd expect to happen in that situation. I did very well in the class. Uh, but what I found was, you know, in, in a way it wasn't very satisfying. Uh, there was another student in the class who was, you know, much younger, but um, serious study of computing. And he um, wasn't as fast as me, wouldn't answer as many questions, but, you know, he wasn't that far away. So if the professor asked a question in class, and so we would do problem solving in class, d design an algorithm, this other student, you know, sometimes would come, come up with the answer before me. Most of the time I would come up with it first. Every once in a while, a third student would come up with it, the answer first, but it was usually me. But this other student 
maybe 10% slower, 20% slower, or I could solve 10%, 20% more, more problems than this other student. And that went on for a while. And I thought, you know, this isn't very satisfying, actually. So what? I'm 10%, 20% better than this other person. That's not, you know, I don't know. I just don't find it intellectually stimulating. So I'm going to start a game. I'm going to start a game in the class because I think the algorithm is really fascinating. So the game I'm going to play is I'm going to up the difficulty level significantly. Okay, I'm going to make it much, much harder. So I'm no longer the first person to solve the problem. In fact, often I won't be able to solve the problem at all, or I'll be the last person in the class. So I'm intentionally going from being the best student in the class to the worst student in the class. And the way I did that was by saying, whenever I'm given a problem, I will identify, you know, uh, the strategy that is obvious or most promising, you know, kind of work out the details, uh, you know, a sketch of how I go about solving it. And then I'm allowed to solve that problem any other way. Okay. If there's, if there are one or two standard approaches, I'm going to solve the problem some other way. It doesn't matter what it is. I can solve it any way I want, but I can't solve it using any approach that I know that seems obvious. Now I will say for exams and homework, I did do, you know, sort of the standard things I, and I got a good grade in the class, but for the in-class problem solving and exercises, I decided to go into a creative mode by radically upping the difficulty and saying, I'm not going to do anything standard, anything that I know. And uh, so I went from being able to answer pretty much any question or any problem to really struggling with, with any, any problem at all in class. Um, but it made it way more interesting, way more interesting to me. It became every, every problem became an extreme challenge. It all effectively became a research course for me because even if someone else had discovered an answer, I didn't know about it. So, you know, I was in the position where, you know, I'm starting over. I don't know anything anymore because I'm allowed, not allowed to use anything I know. You know, I mean, I can use techniques, but I'm, I have to combine them in new ways. I can't use any of the standard recipes. And I remember at one point there was um, a problem and the professor asked, okay, design an algorithm to solve this and then tell me the expected running time. So I worked on it and I came up with, okay, I, I immediately rejected the uh, standard algorithm, which involves sorting a list by comparison, which I knew had a, you know, asymptotic uh, bound of n, uh, n logs uh, n would be the, you know, best, uh, or the, sorry, the average case asymptotic bound. So I rejected that. I took a totally different approach to this algorithm. And at the very end, when he asked everyone what the running time of the algorithm, you know, people gave the standard algorithm running time. And then he said, did anyone come up with a different running time? And I came up with a linear time algorithm. And he said, well, that can't be possible because sorting by comparison is in log n. And he sort of dismissed my result. And then I said, I didn't sort by comparison. And then he said, oh, really? <laughs> and he's like, okay, well, come up to the board and tell us what you did. And I went up to the board and I sketched out you know, this approach I come up with. And then he looks at it and he said, this may be publishable. You know, I've never seen this before. And I said, wow. And it turned out, you know, he showed it to another computer science professor. There was a hidden assumption I had made. And so it didn't, you know, run as fast as I, as I thought it had. I had missed uh, something subtle. But to me, that was probably the moment where my mindset changed to that of, of a research um, mindset and that of, you know, trying to be playful with ideas and trying to, you know, sort of artificially up the difficulty to try to enhance my creativity or try to approach things or see things differently. And, and I have to admit that was pretty addictive, that feeling that maybe I had come up with something new that no one else had, had come up with. And 
that was all it took. From that point on, that was how I approached things. Like I said, for homework, for exams, you know, I would still still do it the standard way. Uh, but whenever possible, even if, you know, and for homework, if I had time, I would try to approach things the other way. And if, you know, if I couldn't come up with anything in a reasonable amount of time, you know, I would just do it the, the reasonable way. But I still, in the back of my mind, might be thinking about these problems. Huh, well, that's kind of interesting. I wonder if there's another way to do it. So you know, that's what I started thinking about. Is there another way to do it? Is there a different way to do it? So that, to me, is at the heart of a lot of idiosyncratic and creative thinking. It's like, okay, here's the standard way of doing it. Let's do anything other than that. Okay, If you just do that, um, that will be great. Oh, I just thought of a new sat, uh, strategy. Okay. Whoops. Spelled the name wrong. All right. Okay, so that's strategy one. Strategy two uh, comes from something from Richard Feynman, who had lots of strategies for idiosyncratic and creative thinking. Uh, and his, his approach, and I, I think this was uh, listed under how to appear to be a genius, that kind of thing was to have 20 techniques and 20 problems that you keep in your head. So for me, I like Mini Canron and relational programming, very interested in that sort of thing, and also program synthesis and you know, related topics. So I've got a whole bunch of problems collected over the last 20 years having to do with relational constraint logic programming, that kind of you know topic matter. So I've got easily 20 problems that that are at my fingertips. And also, as far as 20 techniques, well, Mini Canron is kind of weird enough, and the language has changed to be different enough than, say, Prolog or other logic languages, that there are a whole bunch of techniques I know that are not standard. Or maybe there's uh, sort of unusual scheme techniques or things like that, or maybe just functional programming techniques that I know that, for whatever reason, just aren't that popular. So I have a set of techniques and I have a set of problems. And, and the, the game that you play, and all of these you can think of as games, are whenever you see a problem, you try to match the problem against one of your 20 techniques, your, your toolbox of techniques that are unusual. And, you know, most of the time, probably none of your techniques are really applicable, but you can always say, okay, which of my 20 techniques are you know, seem most promising for this problem. And then you can turn it over in your head. And, you know, if you think there, there's something there, maybe you do a quick prototype or, you know, try to try to do something on paper and pencil or maybe talk to the person to see if, if uh, you can explain the technique to them. Now, it might be hard because if the technique's really unusual, you know, it's probably going to be hard to explain to them. But in any case, sometimes you'll get a match. You know, it's not not super common but if you hear about lots of problems and you're constantly talking to people and reading papers and listening to talks, then you'll hear about lots and lots of problems. And maybe you can't solve the problem that you heard, but maybe you realize that there is a variant of the problem you can change. You can change that problem a little bit, and now it matches one of your techniques. Okay, great. Now you've made some progress. Now you can try to push that and see how far it goes. Okay, that's a great strategy. And the other part of the strategy is every time you see a technique, you see someone do something you've never seen. You see, oh, here's a new technique for a style of programming, or here is a new feature of a programming language that looks really bizarre, or a new par programming paradigm, or here's been a, a breakthrough in an algorithm, you know, here, here, or here's a tool that finally makes something tractable that didn't seem to be tractable before. You know, for example, look at um, large language models or look at uh, SMT solvers and SAT solvers, those sorts of things. Those tools have, have really changed what sort of problems people think are approachable. So whenever you see a technique or tool, then you match that technique or tool to your set of 20 problems and you see if there are any matches there or how close the matches are. What are, what are the problems that most match those techniques or tools, and then you see if those go anywhere. And you do that all the time. You just constantly do that. So it just becomes a habit. Okay. Uh, and, you know, in fact, I did this technique, you know, really, I started doing that technique after the algorithms class. 
um, I sort of came up with this idea. I'm sure people had, had have been doing this for a very long time, uh, but I'd never heard it articulated quite this way before. Uh, so I think that's a, a great technique and allows you to, um, you know, riff on on ideas, riff on techniques, riff on problems, and it's it's a great mental habit, great habit for researchers, a great habit for people who want to come up with new ways of doing things. So I definitely like that approach. Uh, Cisco's rule that goes back to Cisco Nochera, who is the director of the summer camp I worked at for children and adults for many years, and who was my mentor um, in that area. Uh, he has great insight into people and also great insight into the resistance of people to come up with new ideas when they're used to doing things a certain way. And whenever we would sit down to plan out how we're going to do things at summer camp for the next year, in our meeting that he would moderate, he had uh, a cer certain rule. He had, he had really two rules. One rule was, doesn't matter how we did things in the past, everything's up in the air, we can change anything. That was the first rule. But going with that was a really interesting way of having discussions. So if someone proposed a new way of doing things or a change, often there would be resistance. And say, well, I don't know if we're going to be able to do that. I don't know if the National Park will let us do that. I don't know if the state of Maryland will let it do it. I don't, whatever. Okay, I don't know if the counselors will be able to, to pull this off. And what Cisco would do would say, okay, let's stop for a second. Let's assume that we have decided we are going to do this thing. Okay, we've decided we're going to do laundry this way. Laundry is always a problem at summer camp in the woods. Okay, so let's decide that we're going to do laundry this way. How are we going to make it work? How, you know, what is the best approach to make this work? And so we went from a deciding if something will work to now we just have to refine it because that's it. Let's just assume, put ourselves in the mindset of the decision's made. We can't change it. We are going to do it. How well can we make it work? And then we would enter a different mode. I mean, so for some people, it, and sometimes it would it would take a little time for us to get into that mode. It's like, ah, I really hate this idea. It's like, okay, I understand you hate the idea, but let's say we decide to do it now. How do we make it work? And I found that remarkable because there are ideas or suggestions or proposals, which I was totally opposed to. And I thought this will never, ever work. And then once we, you know, played this game that Cisco uh, made us play, often was, oh, actually, well, I think we can make that work now that we've, now that we've investigated it in a lot more detail. You know, some of my concerns, you know, I, th I think, I think we can avoid those. Um, that also reminds me of something that Kent uh, Divig said about the scheme specification. You know, so um, Shea scheme, Kent, Kent Divig scheme is renowned for being very fast. <clears throat> and Kent never wanted to have to implement something that he didn't think he could make fast. So if there was some feature of scheme that was proposed, he didn't think it could be made fast. Well, you know, he was going to be reluctant to have that in the standard. But one of the things he said during one of his talks was, you know, maybe to his continuing surprise, but certainly to his surprise sometimes, when it came down to actually implementing things that he thought would be slow, he could almost always find some way to to make it reasonably fast or to make it fast, to make it perform it. You know, it, it was that once you really dig into the details and um, think hard about it, often you can make things fast. And, you know, I think if you look at the success of JavaScript, optimization, all the work that's been put into making JavaScript fast, or Java also. When Java first came out, like string manipulation was ultra slow, and people have sped those languages up unbelievable amounts. So, you know, I think it's possible with heroic effort or creativity or cleverness, or, or look at the Conway's game of life and look at the hash life insights, right? So, you know, people are able to, to come up with uh, deep insights, you can often speed things up you know, sort of ridiculous amounts that you wouldn't have thought possible if you had just had a high level discussion. So, you know, I, th I think 
it's way too easy to discount proposals or ideas uh, without going into depth, without you know doing the the sort of intellectual work and creative work. Now, of course, there is a reason why people do discard things because we don't have unbounded amounts of time and effort to explore every idea. Uh, however, you know, if you're trying to think idiosyncratically or creatively, I think it's very important to follow this Cisco's rule approach. And for example, the 20 techniques and 20 problems, when I was describing that, I tried to follow Cisco's rule and correct myself. Instead of saying, you know, asking yourself when you see a problem, do any of my techniques match it? Cisco's rule variant would be, which of my 20 techniques do I think is most likely to match the problem I'm seeing? Okay, so you change the problem around. You don't say, it's not binary anymore. Is it not, you know, do any of my techniques match? It's like, well, if I had to rank order my techniques, you know, how, what would that list look like? Or at least the top five. Okay, and then let me, let me drill down and try to sketch it out for each one. And, you know, if you're allowed to change your technique a little and allowed to change the, the problem a little, you might find that actually a pretty high percentage of the time you get a good match. So that's uh, what I'll call Cisco's rule. Okay, another rule is Olin's rule. This is after Olin Shivers, um, who is a schemer and computer scientist and PL person. And he had some amazing advice for running the scheme workshop. So there was... Um, you know, a document saying advice for writing the scheme workshop. And he had a piece of meta advice, which I love. And so the, the document's full of low level stuff for running scheme workshop and how to get the proceedings published. If you have proceedings and whatever, um, how to, how to find a venue if you're doing it on your own. Uh, but the meta advice was the important part and his meta advice said, okay, I'm going to give you a bunch of advice. Here's how you should take the advice. If you don't care about the outcome being, you know, non-standard, if you're happy with the standard outcome for, say, the venue, okay, uh, then you can follow the advice, okay? This is standard advice for standard outcomes. However, presumably, if you have agreed to run the Scheme Workshop, you're doing it because you want to try something different or you have a specific idea about how it could be run better or in a different way. If there is a particular thing you want to do, then you should ignore the advice below that applies to the thing you want to do and use your best judgment because standard advice is for standard outcomes. He didn't use that phrase, I don't think, but that's sort of my understanding. So ignore the standard advice if you want to do something non-standard. And one time, okay, years ago, before I was part of the, the uh, scheme workshop, you know, steering committee, or actually had even served on any workshop at all, I had been telling people that the scheme, scheme workshop should actually, you know, uh, um, hook up with the the closure programmers and closure cons, you know, that the closure programmers are sort of the modern lispers and we should do something with scheme workshop and, and the closure community. Now, somehow that got to people who are organizing the scheme workshop in the past or the scheme workshop steering committee. I don't remember ever telling this directly to any of the people on the steering committee, but at some point I started hearing the rumor that, Oh, I hear you're running the scheme workshop this year. Okay, <laughs> I guess I am. I've been, I've been uh, sort of bad mouthing it. I mean, not not really bad mouthing it, but I'm like, yeah, I think this is something that should be tried. And just by telling people that, uh, somehow it was decided that I would run the scheme workshop. I never volunteered for it, but I was volunteered by my big mouth. So, all right, I'd never run a workshop. I'd never been part of a workshop organization. Um, and so I was told, hey, you run Scheme Workshop? It's like, sure, fine, you're in charge. And I didn't know anything about the Scheme Workshop. And I didn't know, for example, that it could be helpful to have a, a publicities chair and helpful to have, you know, a program committee chair and an organizer, you know, a general chair. I didn't know any of those things. So I just did everything myself. Oh, I tried to. Fortunately, I got help from 
from the closure people uh, with the venue and everything else because I had no idea what I was doing. But the point was, it was right for me in that case to ig ignore any standard advice about where the workshop should be held or the venue because the whole idea of my running the workshop was to try to do something different. Okay, but for other advice, I would follow that if I didn't really care about, you know, if, it, if there was a proceedings and I could follow the standard advice because I didn't care about that. Okay, so I think that's great meta advice in general. And, you know, this, this gets to the heart of being willing to ad reject standard advice and follow your own judgment when you think that's right. Uh, because advice is contextual. Even if someone knows you really well and they're trying to look out for you and they say, you're about to do something dumb, then, you know, okay, you can listen to them. But if you really think you're doing the right thing, you know, you, you may just have to go with your, go with your gut and, and do what you think is right. And then I was watching some videos on reversible computing and the history of it. And Ed Fredkin, who is, I believe, the creator of this whole area of reversible computing, was telling a story about his friendship with Marvin Minsky and John McCarthy and how he asked them when he was starting out in computing, is it possible to create a computer that is reversible, where you can take the operations, you can run it forward, and then you can take those outputs and you can send it back through the computer backwards and get this, the original inputs. And he says that both McCarthy and Minsky, both of whom were friends of his, um, said, no, 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 that's not possible. You know, they just kind of laughed and, and chuckled. They said, there's a proof that this is impossible. You don't know enough. Okay, your, your mathematical, logical sophistication isn't enough for you to understand the proof. It's really complicated, but there's a proof that it's impossible. And even if it were possible, it'd be useless. There's no use to this. Okay, so Fred can said, thank you very much. And then he didn't tell them, but then he worked on it himself. He ignored them, even though these were world famous computer scientists and professors at, you know, MIT and Stanford, whatever. Uh, and he just ignored them. You know, the, these founders of artificial intelligence, he tried to work it out on his own and he did come up with reversible computing. There's Fredkin Gates and this whole area he laid groundwork for. And it turns out that that's critical to ideas in quantum computing because in quantum computing, erasing information is an effect. So um, there's also a classical version of reversible computing, which I'm interested in. So Edward Fredkin basically invented this whole area of whole cloth by ignoring two of the greatest computer scientists who've ever lived who told him that it's both impossible and useless. So I appreciate that spirit. Um, the Kilo Tube, the 1,024 YouTube videos that I'm making this year, that was another example where standard advice, make three videos a week. Okay, that was, I was told by a good friend, should make three videos a week. Um, well, I'm going to make, you know, three videos a day, at, at, at least. Three videos a day instead of three videos a week. You know, I, I appreciate the advice I'm given, uh, but I don't want a standard outcome. What I want to do is have a non-standard outcome where I can sit down and in a single take, make a video and not spend all night tossing and turning, worrying out if uh, the video is exciting or perfect or if people liked it or not. I'm just going to move on to the next video. Make a video, fine, upload it, you know, eat some food, uh, hang out a little bit, watch some StarCraft on YouTube or whatever, and then make another video, okay? Let's live in the life, live in the dream. Mini Canrin, uh, Mini Canrin, this kind of weird uh, logic programming language, uh, we were told by a number of researchers, very experienced researchers at the beginning, that this was a waste of time. Actually, we were told sometimes today that this is a waste of time, including by people who are expert, who are experts in Prolog. You know, this is a waste of time. We're going to be 30 years behind the Prolog people, everything like that. And uh, fortunately, we ignored them. And it turned out that we weren't 30 years behind Prolog. Prolog 
now is 40 years behind where it should be because they headed off in the wrong direction. So we're way ahead of the prologue people, in my opinion, for the things that Mini Canron is designed to do. I have respect for prologue. Uh, I think uh, prologue is full of interesting ideas, but for what I'm interested in exploring, prologue made the wrong decisions. Bad prologue, bad, bad, bad prologue. So Mini Canron's trying to go in a different direction. And Mini Canron is not perfect. I'm going to work on new language that tries to get closer to the ideas uh, that I think are interesting that Mini Canron was was a start in. I'll keep working on Mini Canron, I'm sure, but you know, I'm going to keep keep trying to push the that direction. Um, so Mini Canron wouldn't exist if we had listened, and and particularly um, Dan Friedman was told this many times, and I was told this many times that this is a waste of time, and uh, you know. What's the point? All right. So we stuck to our guns. We did what we thought was right. And in fact, I'd say most scientific advances, certainly most revolutionary scientific advances in our understanding of the world come from ignoring the standard advice because we don't want standard outcomes. We want unusual outcomes. Now, of course, there are times where you know, there's good standard advice because you're doing something extraordinarily dangerous. And if you don't follow the standard advice, you're, you know, uh, in mortal danger. Well, then, you know, maybe that's a good time to, uh, you know, follow the standard advice. But when con trying to do creative thinking and idiosyncratic thinking, standard outcomes is not the outcome for idiosyncratic thinking. That's not the desired outcome. So, why would you listen to standard advice? You shouldn't. You could use the standard advice for the standard outcomes for part of what you're doing, because even if you're doing something very innovative, maybe you have to do the innovation by combining one new technique with 20 old techniques to get something that's very different than what's been seen before. Okay, well, fine. Use the standard advice for those standard outcomes for the standard techniques that you need to use, but for you know, the special sauce for the thing that you're doing that's unusual, you cannot listen to the standard advice. You have to reject it. All right. Another uh, slogan that I love is from the movie Ed Wood. I don't know if Ed Wood ever said this, but this is from the movie Ed Wood, where there's a scene where, so if, if you're not familiar with Ed Wood, he's an American filmmaker who... Um, was famous for a number of things, but he's also famous for being supposedly one of the worst filmmakers in history. And at first I thought, well, it's not hard to make a terrible film, right? If, but what I didn't realize is he was trying to make the best film he could. Okay. It wasn't like he was trying to be ironic. Uh, he was, you know, that was his best effort. Uh, in the movie, he uh, is on the telephone with, you know, the person who gave him money, for his film and he said ah did you see did you see my latest film and the guy said this is the worst film i've ever seen in my entire life and ed wood says well uh my next one will be better and the guy's like you'll never make another movie and i love that my next one will be better and so that's the attitude i have of these videos well that's the most boring youtube video i've ever seen well my next one will be better okay and all right well if if my videos are boring, come back uh, and watch video 512. You know, maybe it'll be better then. I don't know. Okay, the great attitude. My next one will be better. And that is the attitude of someone who makes a lot of things and tries a lot of things. Okay, next point is related, which is find a way, find ways to get past your self-censorship and natural aversion to looking foolish. You know, this is why... When I was making one of these early videos, it took me 76 takes and then I threw it all away, you know, because if anything went wrong, then, you know, got to scrap it all. You know, that's got to be perfect. Um, and then self-censorship. And I've had the same problem with writing a book. So I've written two editions of The Reason Schemer, but those wouldn't have happened without Dan Friedman because Dan Friedman's a finisher. You know, if he starts a book, he's going to finish it. Um, and even though I played a big role in, in writing that book, you know, it was Dan's constant drive and push and, you know, we're going to finish this. Yeah, that's a problem, but we'll get around it. Okay. 
uh, solving these problems and just putting in huge amounts of of effort uh, meant that we definitely, you know, we're going to finish that book. And there were times I didn't really feel like working on the book, but, you know, I needed to be at Dan's house uh, in the morning to work on it. And actually, all right, here's a story I don't think I ever told Dan when the first edition of The Reason Schemer, when we were working on it, um, 2004, I think, maybe summer of 2005. I forget the, the exact time, but at that time, a video game called Crisis, no, no, Far Cry, <laughs> this before Crisis, a video game called Far Cry came out. And uh, I, my brother said, hey, you got to check out this, <laughs> this video game. And I got really addicted to the game. It's this open world game and it sort of, you know, hit every button that I like in terms of exploring the game. It was just really well made. So what was happening is I would go work with Dan you know, Dan would get up at like 6 a.m. and work out and we he would say, come on, come on, come to my house. Where are you? And I'd show up and then we would work and we would work until 10 p.m., 11 p.m., midnight on the book. And then I would go home and then I'd play Far Cry until 4 a.m. <laughs> and I did that every night <laughs> and then just get a couple hours of sleep. But anyway, the book got done. Um, not helped the Far Cry, but you know, it had nothing to do with Far Cry. Far Cry did not help the book get done, but um, it was all due to Dan's, uh, you know, impetus is, uh, you know, we're not, we're never going to stop. We're never going to give up. Um, anyway, trying to get over your own self-censorship and natural aversion to looking foolish, I think is really important. So why have I had so much trouble writing a book without Dan Friedman? Is it, I get too worried about the self-censorship. And, and to, to be honest, I've tried making videos before and I would listen to them and I'd throw them away and say, this is junk, can't, can't do it. So got to find some way to get past that and develop what uh, I've heard called a, a work a day mindset or a ragamuffin, you know, approach, which uh, uh, Jacob Bronowski talked about science having a ragamuffin approach scientists having a ragamuffin approach. I like that. So, you know, a work a day mindset, there's a book called how to write a lot, which I think is a really interesting book and worth reading. And the idea there is if, you know, it's for academics, but it doesn't really matter. That part's not important. Um, what's important is it talks about the difference between someone who's a professional as a writer and someone who's a dilettante or an amateur or who bends rights, you know, when they absolutely have to, in other ways, they don't, touch a pen or, or a keyboard. Um, and what, what makes a professional writer is that they get up every day and they write, or they write three days a week or whatever it is. If you ask a professional writer, when are you going to write next? They can tell you, they can say, well, let's see, it's Tuesday. Um, well, it's going to be Thursday morning at 10 AM. And I'm going to probably write from 10 AM to 1 PM. And then I'm going to have, um, you know, lunch and hang out with family. And then I'll do another hour from probably around five to six. And then that will be it for that day. And then I'll start again on Friday, right? So that's, that is the work a day relationship that a professional has to writing. And so this is why I'm trying to make so many videos 1024 is I want to have a work a day mindset and also sort of a ragamuffin uh, attitude. Well, okay. If that, that one wasn't so great, well, my next one will be better. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Who knows? Um, but but that, that's important. So this is the whole point of these videos, making so many, is so that I just can't, can't deal with, uh, <laughs> you know, um, if I had to make five videos over the next year, I would worry about it so much. Or if I had to make 12 videos, let's say one video per month, I would be, oh my, so sweating. Uh, how in the world do I get this video done? Um, but if I make, make 1,024, it's like, okay, uh, get one in the can. All right, time to start thinking about the next one. Actually, I've already been working on a list of my next 20 videos or something like that. It gives you a different attitude and you just automatically cuts off that self-censorship. You just don't have the, you don't have the luxury of self-censorship if you just have to do it over and over and over again, any more than someone who worked at a fast root food restaurant, you know, after day one, they're not going to be uh, super worried that 
oh no, you know, my uh, the lettuce on this one sandwich, you know, was off kilter a little bit. Um, you know, they have 50 more sandwiches to make and they're not going to obsess over each individual sandwich. They'll never get anything done. So, um, all right. So I'm going to try to apply this uh, attitude to writing because I'm very frustrated that I've tried writing books many, many times and have never gotten anywhere because I keep throwing away. I self self center too much. So I was watching a video by day nine, Sean day nine plot. He had a recent video actually came out yesterday. I think on, uh, you know, the mind, you know, how, how to create things, how to get out of the mindset of a consumer and into the mindset of a creator. So that was an interesting video. Um, and he had one, uh, one thought he had was silo your thoughts where, you know, maybe on Monday you do idea generation for what you're going to do. Friday, you assess what you did but Tuesday through Thursday, there's no assessment. You're not trying to plan things. You're just executing. You've already decided what you're going to do. You just do it. Sort of like the Cisco principle. You just do it. You just do it for those three days. And then you can look back on it and adjust and, and revise. And then you have the weekend to think about it. And then you plan it on Monday. And then you execute again. But when you're in the execution phase... You're not, you're, you're not doubting yourself. You're not asking whether or not this is the right thing to do. You're not asking yourself if it's good or bad. You just are, are working on it and just doing the best you can. You're not throwing things away and, you know, and you're not self-censoring. You just go do it. All right. Uh, okay. So another idea, another principle um, is succeed epically or fail epically. I have no idea if I spelled those words right. It's not important, so I didn't look it up. Um, if my spelling of the word epically is a fail, then it is an epic fail by definition. So uh, the Kilotube project is an example, right? So I, I will probably either make, you know, five videos or I'll make 1,024 videos. If if I make five videos after claiming I'm going to make 1,024, that is an epic fail. That's not that's not a fail of, you know, I said I was going to make videos and I just like kind of never got around to it. Oh, that's too bad. That's not an epic fail. That's just kind of a whimper, right? It's like, no, if I say I'm going to make 1,024 and I make five, well, then that's an epic fail. Okay. So, um, that's fine. But if I make 1,024, that's an epic win. That's an epic success. And if I make significantly more than 1,024, you know, think about how epic that would be. So, you know, I, I've set up the situation where, you know, uh, something epic's going to happen. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I don't know which one it will be, but it'll be epic for sure. Um, when I taught H211, which was the honors intro computing class at Indiana after I finished my PhD, I had this attitude. I had taught the intro class before the non-honors class, and I'd been Kent Divick's teaching assistant for the honors class when I first started at IU for one semester. But um, I wasn't happy with how I was teaching the idea of a side effect in a language or programming. So we were doing scheme programming, but teaching an effect or a side, uh, side effect like printing or variable update or mutation you know, I never felt like I was getting that concept through. And also, you know, I didn't really like mutations. Like, hey, let's just use functional programming. So I was teaching functional programming and I always dreaded getting to the mutation section or the effect section. So I tried, so I decided as soon as I knew I was going to teach this class or might teach the class, I said, okay, you know, I've been doing a lot with art electronics and Arduino and, you know, later I got into 3D printing and art robots and that kind of thing. I said, okay, if I teach this class, what we're going to do when we go to side effects, first I'll teach it functionally. When we go to side effects, everything we do with a, a, a side effect or a mutation or whatever, it's going to be involving a robot or, you know, a physical component or a game. And all the students are going to be making physical games, like board games that have LEDs that light up and motors. I'm going to have robots. And, and then the second time I did the course, we had musical instruments that were all controlled by Arduinos. And we had a robot flute that people made that, you know, had like an air compressor and a bunch of little motors, servo motors, you know, you know, covering the holes of the flute. 
So that was the deal, right? And it's like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna try to pull out the stops and have these first semester college students who've never programmed, many of them, they're gonna be building these robots and building the circuits, designing the circuits, you know, everything. And it's all gonna be programmed in scheme, by the way. And oh yeah, we don't have a scheme implementation that can do it. You know, so that was that was the deal. Uh, and I could tell you it almost failed epically many times, but eventually we got it all to work and it was a ton of work for myself and the students and my teaching assistants and all that, but we eventually got it to work and it was awesome and it worked so much better and it was so much more exciting and so much more energy and creativity than, you know, trying to teach side effects the way I'd been doing it before. So that was, that was an epic win in my opinion. It could have been an epic fail, but you know. I did it. Um, and, and, you know, there are lots of other examples, but I think having that attitude that, okay, well, let's set it up. So it's going to be kind of absurd. Um, it, it's going to be an extreme one way or the other. Okay. We're not going to, we're not going to do it halfway. Um, okay. Another slogan or idea comes from my friend Edward Komet, which is, uh, I think this was in his Twitter handle or something like that. They said, they said something like, if I have a choice between doing two things, I do the thing that people are less likely to believe I did. You know, they're less likely to believe the story, uh, something along those lines. And, you know, sort of a, a corollary of this or, or a similar rule is that if someone's laughing or if someone's in disbelief, you know, if you show something, something to someone uh, and they just don't believe it or they start laughing, you know, that's that's probably a good sign especially from a research standpoint, you know, I, I read somewhere that, you know, research and science, the progress of science, the deep progress isn't about, you know, Eureka. It's about, huh, that's weird. Or, you know, kind of nervous laughter or, you know, wow, that's bizarro. Uh, and so I could tell you a lot of the mini Kenrin, you know, development has been, uh, you know, has been uh, d uh, driven by this and, you know, there's a, a line in So I Married an Axe Murderer, which is uh, most Scottish cuisine is based on a dare. That's kind of how a lot of mini Cannon stuff. I think there was a tweet by Fogus where uh, years ago he proposed a mini Cannon mini confo, and that ended up actually happening. You know, he had a joke tweet, and we ended up having that in uh, Portland. Um, and that, that was a lot of fun. So, you know, that part was a joke. There were, there were jokes when we were first doing mini Canron and, and showing it in Dan's class. Um, we had a version of factorial and I said, oh yeah, someday we'll be able to run factorial backwards and then use those examples to synthesize factorial. And, you know, we can do that now, not very well, but it can be done. Uh, there are other, other examples. Another is, you know, we, Famously, we were able to to get quines working, and that was, uh, you know, an insight from, um, uh, you know, giving a talk at at uh, Closure Conj, you know, giving a demo of everything. And Stu Holloway said, oh, you should be able to do uh, quines, which sounded ridiculous. But then, of course, not only did, it, did we get it to work, but turned out as soon as we figured that out, we could do a whole lot more. But then when I give a demo of the relational interpreter at Indiana later, um, I think, I don't remember if it, who was in the audience who said it, it might've been Larry Moss, but someone said, can you do twines, which are twin quines? And I thought there was no way, but I typed in the, the program and I hit return and it's wait, you know, it's running and running and the fans come on. And so, like, okay, this is certainly an infinite loop. And I said, okay, jokingly, no one can go home until this program finishes. And I got a little bit of a laugh and then it finished. It came back. I was like, oh, even I didn't think that'd be possible, but it worked. So, uh, and then the other part was uh, I knew we were starting to make uh, progress on mini Canrin and some of the relational stuff, especially the relational program synthesis, when really experienced logic programmers, especially prologers, started accusing me of lying. I would tell them what they did, or sorry, what we were doing. And they'd say things like, I understand what you're saying. I just don't believe it's true. I mean, <laughs> things like, I, I don't mean to, to be disrespectful, but, you know, I think you're lying to me right now. And I would have to give them a, a long demo. And then they're like, oh, 
oh, I guess you can do it. And the funniest thing to me is that this was coming from people who were telling me that they were doing the same thing, that they were doing relational programming, they were doing synthesis based on relational programming. But of course, they were doing it in the prologue way where, you know, really they were doing a bunch of kind of hacks. And it's like, no, no, we're doing it, you know, much more directly. Um, so the fact that, you know, someone who claimed to be doing it was accusing me of lying because it couldn't be done, I, I thought was interesting. That that has happened multiple times, actually, that, that someone has claimed to me that, yes, they do that. And then secondly, that I must be lying to them because it's actually not possible to do it. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, which one is it? Uh, but but anyway, those sorts of reactions tell you that you're you're on to something interesting. Okay, I won't say useful because I don't want to talk about useful. Useful is nowhere in this document. Okay, there is no useful here. As soon as you start talking about useful, you are out of the world of idiosyncratic thinking and creative thinking. There is no useful in this world. There's only, huh? That's weird. Okay. Uh, the start of being becoming good at something is being bad at something. You know, there's lots of advice about this. I think that's very true. And an example of that is anything I've ever done. And an interesting observation I heard from uh, closure friends, uh, maybe at Hacker Bed and Breakfast, was that one reason kids learn quickly is that they're used to being bad at things. Okay, if you're used to being bad at everything, well, then who cares? You know, pick up an electric guitar. All right, you're bad at it. Well, you're bad at pretty much everything else too, so who cares? Um, it's just not a, that big a deal. In fact, an adult will probably give you praise for even trying it. Whereas once we become more competent at something, the idea of taking a step back, you know, if you're really good or pretty good at doing something like, you know, I don't know, playing the piano and now you move to guitar and now you have to relearn your chords again or relearn you know, things that you, you had, had uh, figured out 20 years ago, well, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's very tough. That, that's a tough thing because now you're starting over basically as a beginner. So um, I, think, I think we have to be okay with being bad at something and just not worry about it, you know. So I'm bad at StarCraft. That doesn't, you know, have anything to do with how much I enjoy it, actually. I'm, I'm, I enjoy StarCraft. I'm terrible at it. That's kind of how I feel about Scheme and everything else, too, including Mini Kenrin. All right. Identify the assumptions people have about a topic and find ways around them. And this is often true for, say, impossibility proofs. There are lots of proofs of things that aren't possible. For example, famously, uh, Turing and, um, you know, Turing's uh, you know, undecidability uh, results show that, that there are limits on what you can do computationally, and Rice's theorem goes with that, um, the halting problem. But it turns out that there are assumptions there. So there's assumptions that, for example, with the halting problem, that you're using a language that's Turing complete. Um, okay, well, don't use a Turing complete language. Use a simpler language that's sub-Turing complete, and now you can go way around the halting problem, okay? You can analyze those program pr programs in ways you couldn't with... Um, programs and languages that are trying complete. Or you can do the static analysis approach with like abstract interpretation, where if you have to answer the question, does this program halt on all inputs, for example, or any other question that's sort of related, which by Rice's theorem turns out to be everything interesting. Uh, well, if you have to say yes or no, well, you're in trouble if you're in a Turing complete language. But if you're allowed to say, I don't know, then you can always say, I don't know. So now it's suddenly become uh, decidable. And you can then start trying to chip away at the problem and try to figure out, okay, well, in this case, actually we can tell. Uh, in this other case, well, we haven't figured it out yet. Maybe we'll never will be able to. There are cases we know we can't, but we can chip away at things much more uh, readily. Another example I'd say is like SAT solver. You know, so there are all these... Um, complexity theory results and you know, results having to do with uh, NP hard problems and NP complete problems and you know how you can go between NP complete problems and conjunctive normal form and three sat. And in the seventies, I think it was widely believed that if you proved your problem was equivalent to say three sat, then you're just out of luck because we just can't handle this. But 
Now we have modern SAT solvers and SMT solvers, and it turns out that for whatever reason, maybe we don't understand very well, I think, um, there's a large class of problems that we actually do care about that have some sort of structure in them where you don't hit the worst cases with uh, th these, these problems like 3SAT, and you can actually solve them um, you know, for, for reasonable size problems, for problems that, that are big enough that people care about. So now we, you know, we went from, okay, this problem requires SAT solving, Boolean satisfiability solving, so it's hopeless, to, oh, okay, well, uh, you need to do something really hard. We'll just convert it to SAT and then call a SAT solver, and then you know, SAT solvers are super fast, so it's easy. Okay, so that, that was a change in mindset. Um, another example of that is in cryptanalysis, which is an example I, I heard from Alan Sherman was, you know, someone's like, oh, great, I've got this uh, very secure house and it's got this amazing door that's made out of impenetrable material and this lock that no one can ever pick. And I've got the only key. And it's like, well, huh. Well, that's going to be hard to get into. Uh, how about I parachute onto the roof with a chainsaw and just cut a hole in the roof? Oh, yeah. Okay, I just did that. That worked. Okay, so, you know, cryptanalysis is largely about uh, finding assumptions and violating those. And, uh, and I'll also say um, program synthesis as well. You know, um, there's a book on program synthesis I'm reading which is actually a pretty good overview of program synthesis techniques and kind of the current um, popular approaches to synthesis. Uh, and so, you know, it's been interesting to read to learn those techniques. But the other reason I'm reading it is it's laying out, not explicitly, usually implicitly, all of the assumptions that people are making for these types of synthesis. Oh, if you do synthesis, you have to do this. This is the way to do this sort of problem. Well, uh, okay, so they're basically laying out implicitly all of the violation or all the assumptions that you should violate if you're trying to do things differently. Okay, so as soon as someone says this is the way to do this thing, okay, or all approaches do this, all right, now they've just said, they've just told you, you know, assumptions that you can violate to come up with something new. So if if you read this program synthesis book, you know. You can go through, and actually I started annotating, I wrote down every single assumption that I could come up with from reading it about how these synthesis approaches work. It's like, okay, here are a bunch of things that I can do something different. You know, going back to my original uh, algorithms class, I'll do anything other than that. Okay, here's this a technique. Okay, what happens if we just don't do that? What happens if we take this assumption and we say, well, we're going to violate that assumption. Now what do we do? How does that look? Very powerful technique. Play, you know, have a playful attitude. There's a very famous Feynman story where after his work at Los Alamos, when he went to Cornell, he felt he was burned out on uh, physics and he would never do important work again. Uh, and he just didn't enjoy it and wasn't making any progress on anything. And then at some point he said, you know, I used to find physics fun. I used to just play around with it. I used to do the puzzles, you know, see if, physics as a puzzle and just did it for fun. And then he was at the cafeteria at Cornell and he saw people spinning these plates and he was like, huh, I wonder how those plates spin. And so he started trying to figure out the physics of the plate spinning. And one, he was showing it to a, another physicist and the physicist was like, why are you wasting your time on this? Uh, his physics, his fine was like, well, it's interesting, it's fun. Uh, and he said that very shortly after he made you know, discoveries that, you know, were led to um, his getting Nobel Prize. Now, Nobel Prize is interesting because I think that is the opposite of creativity, the opposite of idiosyncratic thinking. And Feynman really uh, resented getting the Nobel Prize because he thought that made life a lot less interesting and, you know, sort of the opposite of creativity and idiosyncratic thinking. So... You know, he didn't like getting Nobel Prize. He wished he could have turned it down. And I, I have come to the same conclusion that, that those sorts of prizes, Turing Award is less, you know, prestigious than, um, you know, Nobel Prize. So, you know, it's probably a little less bad, but, um, you know, 
He, he's convinced me that that sort of prize. And, and he said, you know, he doesn't need prizes. Uh, the fact that people found his work useful, that was enough of a prize. And I agree with him. So there shall be no mini Canron prizes, I can tell you that. At least not when I'm involved with it. Friday Night Hack Nights and Ignoble Prize. Ignoble Prize. Yeah. By the way, I, I have two prizes, the Mant Prize and what was the other one? Mant Prize and some other one. I, I, I announced two prizes. That they were like X Prize type things for kind of, oh yeah, Quips Prize. It was like a Quines Prize and a Mant Prize, which had to do with kind of weird things involving mm, truth maintenance systems and that kind of thing. I got a couple entries. I got a total of three entries. Um, you know, all I could say is it was, it was a very much tail end of peak pandemic um, when I announced those. And uh, I, I foolishly took the, uh, you know, if you build it, they will come approach. So, you know, thanks for all my friends for submitting, <laughs> submitting applications. Uh, it, you know, none of those applications uh, were quite what I had in mind. So I, I could maybe um, brush those off and, and you know, but if I do, it's going to be goofy. It's going to be fun. It's not going to be, it's going to be the opposite. It's not going to be high status. It'll be low status. You know, get some poiful candy as your reward. All right. So uh, playing is very, very important. Uh, let's see. At Utah, we had uh, games night. We did a lot of playing there. And uh, I saw a talk by one of the scientists who discovered graphene. Um, and he said that that was discovered during these, I think they were Friday night, Friday night science nights, or as him and another physicist, they would go in the lab just to do physics for fun. They would just do fun things. And, you know, famously they won the Ig Nobel prize for um, studying frogs levitating in a superconducting magnet. So they got they got no Ig Nobel Prize for that, but then they got a Nobel Prize for discovering graphene. They said it was the same, you know, series of late night or you know Friday night, um, just having fun with physics. Uh, ser those series of experiments was just playful that led to the graphene. So that that was an interesting story. Um, also, I know people who've done Friday night hack nights where it's like, okay, the only rule is. You start hacking on something on a Friday night and you've got to be done with it by the time you go home. Uh, that's the only rule and you can hack on anything you want. But the fact that it has a, a definite end time, you know, can, can add to the creativity. And then uh, one last thing about playing is, you know, my view is you play to explore, not to win. So we had this Utah game night when I was at Utah for a number of years and um, I was... I was told by someone who played the games to win that I was uh, the hardest person to play against or the person they, they would be most afraid to play against if, if there was, uh, you know, high pressure because, you know, I just played differently. Like, I, I wasn't playing to win. I was trying to explore the set of possibilities. So there was a card game, for example, where, you know, you, you would... Um, try to bluff. And so I thought, well, what would happen if I just never looked at my cards? I just, and I, and everyone could tell, I just told people, you know, I'm never going to look at my cards. And then I would make moves where I probably wasn't going to win, but other people were like, okay, this has thrown out all the strategy I know. You know, that was just an example. And with StarCraft, I've played in the StarCraft tournament that was held at Utah, University of Utah. Um, and there was, you know, a pro player there, uh, or at least semi-pro player, a famous player, you know, who was grandmaster. Um, there were there were players way, way, way better than me. But I noticed that whenever I played by the end of the tournament, I would get a big crowd of people around my computer. And I was told by the people who commentated on the games, the cast of the games, I was the most fun to cast because every game I would use like some bizarro strategy and uh, my opponents told me they had no idea what was going on at any time, um, which and and a bunch of the opponents. Well, one one was a little bit salty, 
Uh, but uh, a bunch of the opponents are like, hey, you know, here, you know, join me on Battle.net. Uh, here's here's my username. We're like, we should hang out and play. So, you know, I wasn't playing to win. I was playing to do really unusual strategies and figure out what I could get away with. And the players that I like to watch, like cats or, you know, other players like that, um, had unusual strategies. And uh, day nine, <clears throat> Sean Plott uh, had this amazing series of, of uh, sort of daily StarCraft videos. And he, on, on Mondays, he had what's called Fun Day Monday. And the idea of Fun Day Monday was of a challenge where, uh, okay, let's take standard StarCraft strategy and throw it out the window. So, or make a twist to it. Actually, you don't throw everything out the window. It's interesting when you make one twist. So, um, so for example, one twist is StarCraft is a hidden information game where your opponent normally can't see what you're doing, or at least part of what you're doing, and they can't tell what your strategy is. So what happens if you tell, if you tell your opponent at the beginning of the game what your strategy is or what units you're making? You know, that's, that's like a fun thing. Or, um, yeah, there was a, 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 a StarCraft player who uh, had a Lord of the Lings series where he only made uh, Zerglings and he would tell his opponent, I'm only going Lings, right? And he would win a lot of games. Uh, and it was very funny. I, I saw a Korean pro play a game where he only made um, drones and he won a game, which was, doesn't sound possible. I mean, a long game, not not like a drone rush. So uh, those are really fun. And so, you know, it might be, I don't know what a, what a fun day Monday was. You could find the series online. Um, you can find some of these old videos. But uh, trying to remember what an example of a fun day Monday would be, you know, it would be something like, you know, the standard strategy, but you're not allowed to do one thing. Or you have to make you know, this many units, or, um, there was a, a player named dragon, a Korean player, and he would play, um, games where he changed one of the rules and he would say, okay, I'm going to play this game on ladder against other people. And my rule is, oh yeah, one game he, he played where there are all these minerals on the map. And normally, you know, you're making units and, and fighting in this game all the time or pretty early on. And so he said, actually, I'm going to mine every mineral on the entire map. There's like 80,000 minerals and before I make any, you know, military units, which sounds an entirely impossible. Like it doesn't even sound feasible. And he did it and he won. And it was, uh, and there was another one I saw where he got really far ahead and then he, he uh, typed in, I go to eating now. And then he did a dance on camera and then he went and he ate dinner away from the keyboard. Okay. He ate dinner and then he came back and then he won the game. So, um, the fact that you could even do those things. And to me, that was like, okay, I thought I was good at this game, but here you have someone who could literally go to dinner. It wasn't a short dinner either. He was away for like 15 or 20 minutes and then come back and then win the game. And the other person's trying as hard as they can to win. It's like, oh, you can do those things. And so, I thought that was extremely interesting. So the, the fun day Mondays and, and these games that the people do unusual things. I love that stuff. And, you know, these sorts of ideas can be applied to any area, including programming and, um, you know, anytime you want idiosyncratic or creative thinking. So that is a list of a bunch of, um, approaches or strategies or things that I think about when I'm coming up with it, you know, when I'm trying to, to sort of, you know, either boost my idiosyncratic or creative thinking, or for many of these, I've just internalized them now. That's just kind of the way I work. Um, you know, it's, I actually have to turn it off if I don't want that. I, you know, but a lot of it's contextual. You know, do I, you know, am I doing something where the standard way of doing it is important because of safety, let's say? Well, okay, then fine, I'll do it the standard way unless there's some reason to innovate in some area because it's turned out not to be good. Um, but for many other areas, when I'm in the more creative research, you know, exploratory phase, uh, this is the way I like to think, okay, applying these sorts of things. I'd be very curious what other people find useful for idiosyncratic and creative thinking. So if you have any strategies you would like to share or resources that you found helpful, 
I like to collect these and, you know, I've got a lot more, I'm sure that, that I can find, but these are just a few that I thought of off the top of my head that I find helpful. All right. Uh, that ends the first installment of Will Radio. I hope you enjoyed Will Radio in high def, high def Emacs. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.